Um, hi, I am Sherry from WCET, and I want to thank everyone for joining this roundtable discussion, real world application of learning in a virtual world. Um, we have two chat features. Basically, what you're looking at is Zoom within FeedLoop, which is our the host for our um, actual annual meeting. On the right, the chat feature is in FeedLoop. And if you go to chat in the blue bar underneath the screen, that's where the Zoom chat is. And that is where we would like you to post your questions and um, ideally put a question mark in, in the beginning of that question so we can easily find them. Um, and you can use the FeedLoop chat on the right to um, have conversations, share links, and, and that sort of thing. Um, let me see. Uh, I, I think that's it. Um, if you have trouble at any time, there also is um, a way to reach out to me directly, privately. Um, you can do that. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Alyssa to get us started. Hi, um, I'm Alyssa Albrecht, and I am an instructional designer at the University of Central Florida. Thank you for joining us. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Jessica toho Rabel. I'll let you in. Hello. Yeah, hi. I'm, an, I'm also an instructional designer at the University of Central Florida, um, and I also specialize in adaptive learning. Um, unfortunately, one of our presenters is not able to join us today, so um, it'll just be the two of us. So thank you again for joining us this afternoon. All right, let's get started. All right, so uh, when we say real world learning, what we're really getting at is authentic assessment. And when we're thinking about authentic assessment, we're asking how are we getting students to perform real world tasks that are relevant to their discipline, relevant to their careers, and to be able to apply the skills that they have in those uh, tasks in a way that we can assess their learning. And so when we think of authentic assessment, often we think about things like uh, trainings being in, uh, uh, being together like in uh, uh, like training for a career, um, or doing things like in practice, like perhaps being in a lab, you're going through steps of doing something. But now with the pandemic, so much of our world has gone into this virtual space. And we anticipate that it's going to continue to move into this virtual space. A lot of things are seem to be staying virtual or blended in a way. And so the root of what we were really asking and what we were hoping to get at today during our discussions are now that so much of our world has gone virtual and seems to be staying that way, what does authentic assessment look like in an online environment rather than in the real world like what we normally think of? And so that's what we're hoping to bring everything back to as we go through our guiding questions today. We'll go into breakout sessions um, to really get into and then we'll come back uh, so um, doing that, um, I'm going to pass it on to Jessica to kind of get us started in our first discussion. Okay, so as Melissa said, we're talking about real world application and what it means now that the pandemic is hit and we've gone kind of remote learning or fully online. Um, the first question I pose to everyone is how can real world application of concepts be meaningful to students? So thinking now in our current situation, how can these um, real world applications um, be meaningful to students now in a virtual life that we're living in? Because I feel like everything now is on Zoom or um, Microsoft Teams. So how would that look like now? So we're gonna go ahead and break out into our first breakout session. And we're gonna give you about five minutes to kind of discuss in your group what um, to kind of help answer this question. And then we'll come back together, like Alyssa said, and kind of share some ideas that each group came up with. So we're gonna go ahead and go into breakout room. All right, Jessica, if you could uh, share our screen again, just to make sure that we oh, all- Oh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't realize it no disappears after you come back from a breakout room. Okay, so there we go. So each group, I don't know the number of groups we had, um, but if you are willing to share with the 
the, the whole group, that would be fantastic. So what kind of discussions were had in your breakout room? Um, if you want to go ahead and raise your hand and we can call on you to share, or if you just want to unmute and start sharing that work too. Hi, I can share from my group. Um, okay, great. Think, hi, um, this is Di Wu. Um, I'm also an instructional designer from um, Wisconsin. Um, in our group, we discuss a little bit about um, how how we are creating real world application in teaching and learning. Um, one of the um, computerized accounting instructors shared that um, he created some um, like personal budget um, practices for students to to practice how to how to make a budget. I think it's a good example. Um, and I share that um, I I use uh, articulate storyline to create some um, real world um, counseling um, practices for uh, students from uh, substance abuse. Um, disorder counseling um, to help students to practice those uh, counseling skills. That's Thank you. Um, kind of on, on a side note, but relevant still, uh, using articulate storyline is a, a great example of, even as an instructional designer, as I was going through my own programs, being able to um, utilize that would have been so helpful. Uh, it's such an industry standard, and it wasn't something that was pushed or required in my program, but it would have been really helpful as a skill to develop uh, for my future career. I agree with you, Alyssa. I had a similar experience when I was going through school as well for instructional design. So that would have been very helpful to know because a lot of job opportunities are requiring that skill and I didn't acquire that. So that would have been helpful to have that practice for a future career in instructional design. Yeah, I think that that would have brought a lot of meaning to um, to what I was doing. It would have made it more applicable rather than utilizing a, a, a tool that I could maybe use in another um, discipline. Something that was really specific to our discipline would have been helpful. That would have made it more meaningful uh, for me. Um, any other thoughts from anyone else? Uh, we talked about how um, students are you know, just generally confronted with like needing to have digital literacy. Um, and I think, and, and being more comfortable with or feeling an expectation to have like a digital presence to have like an impact, like social impact and things like that. And so scaffolding that in and giving them the tools and resources because students come in with like unequal understanding, unequal skill sets, unequal like exposure on how to sort of be savvy about navigating those spaces. So um, we'll do things like, you know, in a web development class, uh, pick like a local business or volunteer organization or uh, to build a website for them to, to just sort of like, instead of just, you know, build a website that has these chunks and, you know, give in something, but like, oh, you know, apply your skills to something that would be meaningful um, or translate your knowledge into a format that you might put in a blog or a podcast or, you know, a website or something. Um, and giving students the option to decide like how public they actually want their own material. It's within like the safe FERPA regulated classroom, but just simulating um, something that they could use if they wanted beyond the classroom can be really empowering for students. They can feel like, you know, what they have to say matters um, and that they have the skills to really do something, but it also gives them those tools that they are going to need in order to, to connect with communities uh, after their education. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Well, that's, you know, really well said. I think that uh, you know, sometimes we need to think beyond learning objectives and going into just the, that real world skill set. I, I really appreci appreciate that. Um, maybe time for one or two more. I, I would add in a sort of meta way, when we think about taking what you're doing within the classroom, understanding the hurdles that we had transitioning into a COVID distance learning environment, 
um, points of access. Um, many students struggled to have access to the technology, to the internet, and those sorts of things. Um, that's a real world issue as well. And that may be something we can highlight in a way that students will better understand and take that out into their experiences in the real world. Yeah, that's a great point. At the beginning of the pandemic, I know that some of our students were having issues with access to their learning after we went remote and they didn't have a computer, they didn't have internet access. So that's, I think, something we should definitely think about and, you know, as we go along with our instruction. Um, so I guess we'll move on to the, to the next then. I feel like we had some good conversations there. So as far as benefiting and how it can be meaningful for students, I think it just, it benefits them overall. There's so much that authentic assessment when we're looking at that real world application of learning that it does for students. It, develops their skill sets, it uh, involves creative thinking, um, problem solving, brainstorming, investigations, they have to kind of refine solutions as they're thinking about the different ways to approach the problem. And uh, many times it's done in a group format. And so there's that communication skill also that's really relevant, especially when we're considering having to do so virtually. Uh, just that skill alone of being able to work together uh, when you may be miles and miles apart is really important. But I think that overall, then what we're saying is it really helps to develop some resilience because if you are going through and you're having to determine all of these new skills and new approaches and be innovative, and you don't really know where to start and you're working with your team members, you know, that you get some grit there as you're trying to find new ways to um, approach it. And so really when we're talking about authentic assessment, I think in essence, we're saying knowing versus doing and doing well on a test. A lot of times we make this assumption that that means that there is evidence that if they can understand the concept, they have that recall of the procedures for a, an approach or something, that they are able to um, actually apply that in their real world when it's really not. Knowing and doing are very different. Um, so if we can think about like, even sports, it's like sports is a great uh, way. If I was a coach for a team and I was teaching them baseball and I wanted to know like, can they, uh, you know, swing and hit the, the ball appropriately, effectively, uh, I could assess their knowledge of the different um, like mechanisms of what they, how they should move their body, the steps, the rules of the game. But that's not the same as can they now go and actually hit the ball? Like just because they know it doesn't mean that they can actually do it. Um, and the same can be applied to our disciplines in classes, right? So we can say things like, you know, um, in a communications course, a debate, you might know the different components of the debate, but can you actually do it? Could you, um, if you may know how to dissect a frog, um, you know, the different anatomy of the frog, but can you actually physically do it? Can you provide that real world context? And so I think that that's when we're really not relying on memorization, when we're getting them involved, you're creating higher buy-in and they have that more control over their approach, which increases just the capacity for learning and engagement in which we all know that at the end of the day, engagement really does mean learning for students. So just some thoughts to, as we go into uh, our next question. Okay, so kind of putting on from your experience, we've all been through school and you may have experienced a real world application in your courses. So think back to a course that had you apply your, your knowledge into doing something with that knowledge and how did it help you in your career and, and what were they like? So kind of talking in your breakout rooms again, think about that experience you may have had as a student. I know I have to really think back because I have a terrible memory. So hopefully I can think of something. Um, but yeah, just kind of how did that help you in your career? Because that application must have helped you in something in the future. So um, let's go ahead and do our breakout room and, I, and, and have that discussion. Hey, I think that we all may be back. 
So have you ever experienced real world application in your courses as a student that you felt helped you in your career? Um, any cool anecdotes to share from your breakout sessions? So uh, I can speak, I was, I actually got pulled into a breakout session. Um, and one of the things that somebody was shared was that they were teaching technology courses. And what they tried to ensure is that even when they were demonstrating the content, um, that they were um, giving students the opportunity to go into that same tool and practice it at the same time. So, you know, it's it's fine if you're, you know, demonstrating, you know, a screencast of how to approach something, but really giving them the options to be able to go into the tool. There's just something about, you know, being able to, uh, to get in there. I think that, you know, I, as an instructional designer at UCF, one of the things that we really do is we train faculty and our faculty are our students as we're training them to conduct on themselves and design and develop online courses. And I always try to make sure that faculty have a development shell in Canvas as they're working through. And I try, I try to assure them like, you're not gonna break anything, you know, go in there and really get in there and play around with it, mess with the tool. That's the only way you're gonna learn. Like I can give you guides and uh, as far as the technology piece and I can show you how to do something, but there's just not that same kind of retention as to when they actually have that tool in front of them and they get the chance to really practice it even in a virtual um, way. Uh, as far as my own experience in uh, application application and, and courses, um, I think that one of at least my experiences, and hopefully I'll share mine, and then maybe you'll feel compelled to share yours. Um, so uh, something that I I absolutely loathed in graduate school was um, online courses that had group projects, and we've all been there with a group project where you feel like you are the only one who is doing anything. And you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I had another group project. Like, please, I'll take double the work. Just let me be, be the one to go in there and, and just do it on my own. I'd rather than work with people. But you know, sometimes that's the case in real life too. When you work on a project with other people, even professionals, sometimes people aren't always doing what they need to be doing. And having that, maybe that wasn't the purpose of a group project. But being able to learn how to, you know, use Google Docs and different things. I mean, this was you know, back in the day, but being able to do those things had me learn, number one, how to work with people when I wasn't in the same space with them. But it also had me learn how to um, resolve conflicts in groups and how to communicate better and, you know, sometimes be a little pushy. Like, hey, you know, you still haven't done this yet. You know, have you ever sent that email? Like, to reiterate my previous email or um, as per my my previous email, you know, and you have that where you're kind of pushing people, those are just skills too that you need in communication as, when you're in a, um, in a profession as well. And so it was a kind of an inadvertent thing, but I definitely think that even though um, I didn't have necessarily, you know, I'm not necessarily doing that skill, like it wasn't necessarily a um, objective for the assignment, it did give me this real world experience and different skills that helped me in my career, um, for sure. So I'll get off my soapbox and I hope somebody else can share a little bit too. Um, I don't know if this helps at all, but um, I can just share a few experiences uh, that we've used at our institution for some, you know, I, I don't know if it fits the mark for this this uh, dialogue or um, talk, but we, we for, for our nursing programs, we use a lot of simulations, vSIMS, shadow health technology uh, for, um, for the students to interact uh with with that type of virtual experience uh, we also uh, implement a lot of uh, 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 custom cybersecurity virtual labs for students to you know uh, work through scenarios so they can you know fail succeed and uh, you know uh, work through those through our uh, masters and undergrad programs um, so I guess those would be two. We, we have some other stuff, but th th maybe that's two examples of uh, leveraging some of that virtual um, technology and integrating it into the curriculum and the courses. 
Absolutely. And I think that, you know, those students can probably speak to how those um, things impacted their career as they gave them skills in the future. And it was done in a safe way, right? It was done online. It wasn't that they were out in the field quite yet. Maybe they weren't just ready yet for it, but they gave them that safe place to practice that skill set. So thank you, Rick. Yeah, and and, and, it's, and it was connected to, you know, career-oriented outcomes. Um, you know, the, the cybersecurity is connected to the NICE framework, which is uh, industry framework. So so there's some, some meaningful connections to career-oriented outcomes. So mm -hmm. that was another, another component there that I think uh, has been successful for those students in those courses. Absolutely. Anyone, Anyone else? else? One more. Um, anybody want to share? Any takers? You know, I. I, I sorry, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Anne. So I was just thinking as you were speaking about group work, and boy, I can remember hating that. Um, but I remember one course that I had that did a really good job of um, after a group uh, a group project doing postmortems and really looking at what worked and what didn't work and giving that critical lens as to, okay, this was your group, this is what worked, this is what didn't work, um, was a nice critical way to give us skill sets to be more effective going forward in the group setting. And I could see where that would have real um, world value. So I'll just throw that out there. Yeah, absolutely. I think that reflective piece is critical as we're having students engage in these kind of experiences. Right. Okay, so let's keep going. So um, as we're thinking about this and uh, with, you know, what was maybe impactful for you in your career, uh, something, some kind of authentic assessment or real world tasks that you were given in your courses, um, to be successful, these authentic assessments really need several pillars here. Um, and so they need to be based on realistic situations. They need to align with clear objectives. So um, making sure that if you're ha if you are uh, teaching a class in law and you're looking at tactics for cross-examining a witness, that what you're having them do is actually related to that and not maybe related to like some kind of subcontext in another way, like making sure that it's really aligning with what you're trying to assess there. Um, it's comprised of complex tasks for investigation. So there shouldn't be a single answer. Uh, when we're creating these authentic assessments and we're, when we're guiding faculty to create these, you should be multiple ways to approach this um, or getting to you know, the end goal. It should have multiple ways to go about investigating, researching, um, promote collaboration. I think that's what we were, we've talked about several times now about working with others during these scenarios. And so improving their communication skills as they're working, learning how to work in a group. And a lot of times they get feedback from each other then as well, right? So uh, how can we, um, you know, if, even if you're doing like, uh, like what Rick said, if maybe you're assessing a patient, you're triaging a patient um, in nursing. Uh, if you're working with others, they might be like, hey, that's not the right approach or maybe we shouldn't do this this way. And through that dialogue, there's a lot of learning that takes place as well. And then um, Anne, uh, ended up saying it as well. She said, encouraging feedback and reflection, you know, that reflective please having that post-mortem after a group project can be really impactful. Um, so ensuring that there's some kind of way to self-assess, to reflect whether it's like that, or maybe even just in a survey, in a video, in a, in a journal as they're going through this process to see how they're growing and learning through their process. Okay, so that brings us to our next question. With the shift to remote learning last year, um, what was your experience with synchronous versus asynchronous teaching and learning at your institution? Um, I know that we had a lot of shift to a lot of video courses utilizing Zoom for their synchronous component. Um, so just kind of sharing in your breakout room, what are some of your experiences with those types of um, instruction in your, at your institution. So we're gonna go ahead and break out again um, and hopefully have good discussions in our small group. All right, so anybody wanna share anything now about their uh, experience with synchronous or 
uh, asynchronous or just the transition um, to remote learning and maybe some things that it taught us as we move forward? Well, I'll be happy to share, although for me, because I was already asynchronous online 100%, the pandemic actually didn't impact my teaching. What it impacted was my students learning because they're nurses, they were all, they're all nurse, working nurses, and suddenly they went from 40 hours a week to 70, 80. I had people working literally 14, 15 days in a row of 12 hour shifts and yeah. trying to shove their learning in. So I had to get pretty creative. Wow, that's intense. You know, that um, you have to, we, we kept telling our faculty that we had to give students grace, that these were unprecedented times and as they're moving through this, how, uh, you know, they're, we have to give them some grace if they figure out internet issues, as they have family members that are sick, as they've lost jobs, as, you know, and I feel uh, that kind of echoed what you're saying there, of that grace and that empathy, which is something that was discussed in our group, uh, was really thinking about, you know, an empathetic perspective. And um, I even had uh, somebody share how they might level the playing field when we had people who were outside, you know, they were um, already remote and other people weren't. And what did that look like as they now had to understand what that felt like? And I, I can, I definitely think that that is not a uncommon uh, experience, Cheryl. Anybody else? Um, I can go ahead and share something. Um, so this remote learning, the shift to remote learning kind of caused UCF to change our course modality. So we um, identified course modalities and implement attributes to courses. So, so that it, would, it was clear to students what kind of course they were signing up for. So for example, I work with a faculty member who teaches a video course, that's the modality, um, and it's online with a live attribute. So that means it's got the synchronous component where students are, are have to attend a scheduled live class session. But what I really like about what this faculty member did is they utilize that live session instead of lecturing, having students apply their knowledge that they acquired online with active learning strategies that they did in the live session, as well as implementing escape rooms or breaking students out into groups to do, to work on case studies. It's, it was a, a STEM course, I think microbial metabolism. So having that synchronous component was actually beneficial for students in, in that modality because they were able to apply those skills in some type of activity instead of you know getting that lecture that I'm sure a lot of faculty give during those synchronous sessions. Um, does anybody else want to share? Yeah, uh, something that I ran into a lot with faculty as uh, I worked with them and the transition to remote teaching um, was there was this major concern about um, exams and cheating. And I think it made a lot of faculty have to reconsider how their exams were. They, they, were, they kept feeling like face-to-face -face exams were this gold standard of there's not cheating on these tests, which we know is not always the case anyway. But how can we prevent it in an online um, environment? I think that one of the ways that we talked about was application questions. You know, we, don't, we didn't necessarily have lockdown browsers at UCF. And uh, so saying, you know, adding application questions, or does this actually have to be a, an exam? Like rethink about your assessment completely. Is there another way to do this? Is there another way to assess student learning here and provide students with feedback um, that might be beyond just an exam uh, as we're considering this? But we were, they were doing things like uh, asking like 25 seconds a question to make sure that they couldn't look it up. And I was like, we can't do this. We need to expand this. This is not the, you know, the right approach. We have to give students grace, especially just with internet issues. They need, you know, more than 25 seconds um, for a question. So uh, that was just uh, some of the things that I, you had to just completely rethink everything. Not only that, Alyssa, that's so inauthentic. Because nobody, there is no job out there that wants you to answer questions in 25 seconds. They expect you to use resources. 
We should be teaching them how to use resources, how to be team players to find those answers, not 25 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I was like, this is not the approach we need. And I think that that's, you know, that speaks back to, you know, real world learning, authentic assessment, you know, being invested, having to investigate, having to research your response or your approach. That's absolutely what we do day to day. I, I never would claim to know everything about any, about any subject, you know, even as a professional who's been in, in the career for years, there's still things that I have to look up and remind myself and there's not shame in doing so. So all right, Jessica, let's keep going. Okay. So some of the online approaches that uh, I particularly saw um, at UCF um, were things like augmented reality. So online games, different ways that we approached real world learning online. So uh, we had, yeah, I mentioned like Frogopedia earlier, earlier um, but there's also things like we have um, Materia, which is an open sourced um game platform has a game templates and widgets. Thank you, Jessica, for the right word. Um, and there's things like choose your own adventure is what we call it. And so we have different paths of adaptive gaming where students are, um, one of the uh, nursing is actually an example where students are given a, uh, you know, a, a patient and how do they triage this patient? And as they go through and they make different choices, the game changes based on the choices that they make. So hopefully at the end, they end up with a patient that has a full treatment plan and that they can uh, be successful, you know, coming out healthier um, and not a patient that has suffered something much worse. So uh, things like that, um, we've um, really seen uh, take off. Um, the use of role play. So the use of role play through group discussions. Um, we've seen it where, you know, even I have a family communication professor that I work with and she has them apply different communication tactics through that family class in group discussions as they go through and they have to consider um, how should they be approaching these different communication ways. Um, and so we have, uh, in our LMS have set up group discussions where they go into the small groups, have this discussion as their different family members, and then come back to the role play. Um, I think that you know a lot of times with uh, with online learning, we think of like face to face learning as this gold standard that we have to try to meet. Uh, when really something like role play actually hands itself better to the online world. It can be really intimidating to take on a role to act like a, you know, a, a certain persona going through a scenario. But in the online world, there's that degree of separation where you feel a little less scared to take on this personality, to make mistakes, it's a safe zone. You're you know, assessing a patient um, in, a, in, a, in this zone. You, you're not as afraid to make mistakes, you're not as afraid to really get into the role and bring that concept to life. So in some ways, role play, I would always say, better approach um, in uh, the online world. And we've also seen things like case studies and online debates, even online via, you know, Zoom. So, you know, doing a fishbowl technique where you have people who are in the bowl participating in the discussion and people who are out of the bowl and they are watching and reflecting and coming up with questions regarding that discussion. So thinking about things like, you know, in maybe a marketing class, like, you know, here's a case study of this particular business. How should they be able to, um, to approach uh, a social media presence for this business to in increase their space in the market? And having that debate go back and forth. So uh, just different ways that we can still, just because we're not in the real world, doesn't mean that we cannot give real world experiences um, to our students to really promote their knowledge and learning um, based on the objectives even in our class. I, so, I didn't mean, I was gonna say, I didn't mention this in my group. And sure. this, this might be a tangent a little bit, but I, uh, I work I with one instructor. <laughs> yeah, I work with an instructor who um, normally did classroom stuff and she would bring a guest in, a guest lecturer in once in a while. And when she was doing her stuff on Zoom, she um, she was worried that it wasn't as engaging and so forth. And so she did this whole panel discussion where she brought um, she I think she was in uh, she was in social work I think I think she was teaching a, a course on 
raising kids with disabilities or something. And she brought in and she brought in all these experts and some parents of a child, but she was able to bring them all in from their, from their, you know, their homes um, mm -hmm. and have a whole panel discussion. And then, and we're sort of back on campus now. And now she's doing that and she hadn't done it before, but now she's bringing a lot more guests in via Zoom into the classroom because I think yes. she just figured out, oh, this is pretty easy to do. You know, you could bring people from across the country in and they don't have to leave their house. So, um, yeah, exactly. I think that that actually is better to bring in these guest speakers because you can get so many different people from different places around the world even. So I think that's really a, a neat way to, to transition from what she used to do to the Zoom um, experience. So thank you so much for sharing. I'd like um, to jump in and share something real quick. Yeah, too. Absolutely. So, um, <laughs> so something similar happened for me for years. I've been wanting to have my students as soon as they learn how to program. So they're a brand new introduction to computer science. We do a little, you know, hour of code kind of thing. They do a project. But I've been wanting to get them into like a grade school after, right after, and have them teach the little ones because you learn it better when you teach it. Plus that service, you know, we're extending that information down to a younger group, whatever. But I never could figure out really how to do it. Do I have to do background checks for my students? You know, what does it entail? And so when the pandemic happened, I'm like, oh, we can just we can just reach out to a grade school who has some computers and have them zoom in with us. And that's what we did. And so we're continuing to do that now, uh, even though we're back face to face. We're going to have in a couple of weeks some grade schoolers come in and my current group will teach those guys. That's awesome. That's such a neat way for them to, to learn the material even better by teaching those small ch the, the grade school children. And then they learn a skill too. So that's a win for everyone. It really are is. They, and it's very it's precious yeah. to watch. Are they, um, are they teaching them individually? Are they working like, a, like as a group doing it? Is there any kind of like reflection? I always worry. So um, I, I have been doing it with breakout rooms and I make sure there's always two of my students with however many of the grade school kids. So um, it's usually two of mine and then however many, it depends on how many come, like we could have up to five young people maybe. And usually there's a teacher in the room with the grade school kids. Okay, that's really neat. Um, I don't think we have enough time to go into a breakout room, but I do want to, along the lines of what you were just talking about, both of you were just talking about, um, it's what practices were, for, were you forced to implement that you've kept because of remote learning, and then what practices didn't work? I know that a lot of different things were kind of kind of thrown in to see if they worked and didn't work. So what were just kind of in this big group, let's go ahead. I think we have about a minute and a half to share. So does anybody want to share what practices that you were forced to implement that you kept? And it sounds like you, you're keeping that Zoom teaching uh, code and guest speakers. So that's awesome. Any other? So one of the things um, that I did in, in my classes when they went online is I started using mini lectures instead of like a full long lecture. And I we have a green screen on campus, which we're lucky enough to, to have. So I went to the green screen room. I, I recorded all these uh, lecture videos, but they're all 15 minutes or less. Most of them are, are between five and 10 minutes long. And so then each week students will get four to five videos, but they're all very short. And that has been amazing for the students. Um, I found students rewatch lecture videos like all the time now because they just know like, okay, I have problems with this one topic. It's a five minute video. So they'll go rewatch it. Um, and that was something that I never had with the longer videos. So I've actually not only kept a hybrid approach in my classes now because I like my online videos, but I've also uh, started implementing the, the mini lectures in my other classes. Um, and so I'm splitting up all of those lecture videos into small chunks that are topics at a time. You know, we have um, a video team, we're lucky enough to have one, and they, when they look at the data, they see that though those mini lectures, those are our most successful ones. We can just see the students just completely logging off as the videos get longer and longer. And that's that, you know, how much time are they really spending looking at that screen? Uh, are they doing other things? Are they folding laundry? Which I mean, maybe they are, and that's okay. Uh, but, you know, we find they are able to sustain their attention much longer as they are having those short um, 
videos. So I'm glad you uh, were able to implement that elsewhere as well. But I think we're actually out of time. Out of time. Yep. Yep. Well, thank you, Jessica and Alyssa. Um, I just want to thank all the attendees as well. Um, the survey I think you should see popped up on the session. Speakers love feedback, so please take a minute to do it. And um, this session was recorded and will be available soon. And we have five more sessions coming up in 15 minutes. So we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.